tear up um, as an acronym sounds, uh, we uh, basically advocate for socioeconomic rights, which would deliver human rights as constitutionally provided in Chapter 2 of the 1990 Act. Um, and we've discovered that uh, corruption and the lack of transparency and accountability are the basic factors that do not allow Nigerians to enjoy this right, which is why we've incorporated um, transparency and accountability into the core work uh, that we do. Uh, freedom of expression is one of those rights that we're passionate about and that we've incorporated into our work. And that uh, also includes data and digital rights. Incidentally, we launched a report on data and digital rights um, some couple of days ago. And I, I think someone was from PIN. Prada initiative was, was there. And we do do some bit of litigation from time to time. Uh, yes, I think we have about um, 37 lawsuits against the uh, different tiers and arms of government. And all in the public interest, I must note. Uh, they are not uh, suits, as it were, that you consider frivolous. It's go to the other of the matter. For instance, the ban of Twitter. Uh, we had gone to court to challenge what we saw, and clearly the Constitution supports this as um, an unlawful infringement on the part of government including the various um, directives of the NBC, for instance, against the TV and radio and media houses. And also um, the, the, the ban, the, the blocking of SIMs is something we are going to court recently about. So that goes to the heart of what we're discussing here today. And all this is in the public interest to make sure that we can enjoy our rights uh, to the fullest. So I'm very happy to be here and to be on this panel. Thank you very much. If you want to clap, let's clap very well. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. I have the floor. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Osai Ojigo. I'm the country director of Amnesty International Nigeria. We're based in Abuja. Um, it's really a great honor to be here uh, to participate in Drift 22. Um, in terms of what Amnesty International stands for, we're a human rights organization. We campaign and advocate for a world where everybody's human rights is respected. Um, as an organization that is over 60 years old, we were established in 1961. We have several Amnesty International entities in over 162 countries in um, Africa, Europe, and of course, basically everywhere. Um, that you can think of. And as much as people think that we're very, we are over uh, interested in the Nigerian government, Amnesty has released several reports on the activities of the US government that infringes on human rights, the United Kingdom, in Germany, in Australia, particularly more recently, the impact of the restrictive policies on refugees and migrants, which has led to long years of um, enforced um, imprisonment for many people running away from periods of um, unrest and um, climate um, issues that have led them to flee their home countries to seek safety. With regards to digital rights as well, Amnesty International has been one of the forefront of human rights organization working to ensure that human rights is in all aspects, whether it's in create, creation, use of technology, the development, how the algorithm has been used to actually incite rather than to enhance and help human rights. A couple of years ago, we also established the Amnesty Tech Program and opened our first office in Silicon Valley, which is working with the technology community to ensure that human rights is not violated in the quest to use technology to make our life easier, We've also been involved with issues around privacy, surveillance, targeting human rights defenders, and how technology can be used to enhance protection rather than expose vulnerabilities for human rights defenders and activists working on the ground. We've done quite a number of research, looking also at how robotics is being used in war as a means to identify and take off targets, but also the discriminatory practices which means that certain communities and people could be targeted as a result of the way it's being used. Overall, the work that we do is to ensure that no one loses their life uh, as a result of doing the work they do. Uh, freedom of expression is entrenched as a critical aspect and foundation for all other rights to be enjoyed. Bringing it back home to the African continent, we've done a lot of work on pushing 
for freedom of the media and of the press and freedom of expression um, broadly in terms of the way NGOs and activists carry out their work. Our, er our um, will I say our entry into more of the um, strategic litigation in this area was spawned on by the fact that African governments tend to limit the press and by extension now, online spaces ahead of elections. So our colleagues in Amnesty Togo did bring a suit a couple of years ago challenging the suspension of um, the internet ahead of the elections. We've also documented the use of the blackouts in Cameroon and more recently in Nigeria, the Twitter ban and how these are ways through which government continues to limit freedom of expression, but also dissemination of information in that the name of security or fighting terrorism. Amnesty Nigeria, um, together with other partners, were very critical in intervening in the Twitter case ban brought by Sarah. We submitted an amicus in that suit. And of course, we we're waiting for the judgment before government decided to lift Twitter and then brought an argument saying that Twitter, that since it's already been lifted, there's no need for us to continue. However, we are waiting 10th of May for when the ECOWAS court has since now decided that they would be releasing their um, decision on that particular case. Broadly, we've also brought out a lot of research on freedom of expression, looking at how the Cybercrime Act, Terrorism Act, and other practices and abuses by security agents with the approval or tacit knowledge of their enablers have led to a shrinking of civic space in Nigeria, but also endangering voices such as yourselves uh, who use the online media, uh, social media as means of communication, dissemination, but also for economic activities. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I, I like it a lot. Uh, it's very important, uh, and I'm and I'm happy that I asked that you did this because there are things you talked about that I never imagined that Amnesty International are involved in. And one that struck me particularly uh, is your work around robotics. You know the risk of robotics in war and how it can affect a targeted set of people. That's really very interesting. Then about her, and I'm sure Kadija too is because I can see she was nodding her head. Yeah, that's something I know she would find very interesting too. So Khadija, I'll come to you now. Uh, I wasn't sure if I, you know, wanted you to talk about Paradigm Initiative because I imagine that many people must have talked about Paradigm Initiative between yesterday and today. But I think it's an opportunity for us to talk, for you to tell a lot about uh, the area of work that you particularly lead at Paradigm Initiative in terms of intervention in, in Nigeria uh, and some of the things that you have laid. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. So I uh, said I shouldn't talk about paradigm initiative. I was ready to go on the whole uh, social enterprise. <laughs> um, but truly, we we we've all heard about that. We know that paradigm initiative um is a social enterprise that concentrates its work on um, digital rights, digital inclusion, technology policy. But this panel is about freedom of expression, so I, I would limit myself to the work that we have done around freedom of expression. And like Osai said, freedom of expression is the mother of all rights. Um, it's the right that all our rights come from. It is from your um, ability to express yourself that the right to freedom of the press comes, the right to freedom of association, the right to freedom of assembly. So it is necessary for us to protect um, the right to freedom of expression. And because of where the world has gone to digitally, um, the right to freedom of expression online, which is where we have placed a lot of our focus, has become um, very important. So in the pursuit of this, we have taken on basically I would break it down into three advocacy initiatives when it comes to uh, freedom of expression. So the first one would be um, AYETA. So AYETA is a, we developed a digital rights toolkit to protect um, digital rights defenders, journalists, 
all around Africa, especially. So we find that, or we, we found that um, freedom of expression is steadily being clamped down by state actors in the world over these days. And I'm sure that this panel is going to talk a lot about that, the way the government has chased down um, journalists, bloggers, arrested them, all of that. So that toolkit is, is um, our attempt at, at helping to protect all of those digital rights defenders that are online. So you would find um, different digital security initiatives on there. Um, I think before the IETA toolkit, to be honest, I didn't know VPN existed. So <laughs> um, that, that was a fun learn, um, two-factor authentication, things like that. So that is something that you would find there, what to do in terms of an internet shutdown, God forbid that happens in Nigeria, but who knows? It's happened in um, about, I, I think, am I overshooting by saying 34 African countries at this time, but it keeps happening. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not impossible. So it's something that we need to prepare ourselves for. Uh, the second thing that we've come up with in terms of protecting freedom of expression is Reporti. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it um, in this room. So Reporti is a digital rights violation reporting platform. Um, so we try to use it to one track data. So we don't know how many digital rights violations keep happening around Africa. So it's great to get those numbers so that when you start the advocacy initiative, um, you know what it is exactly to say. I think it's more powerful to say there were 1,000 digital rights violations in Abuja that happened today as opposed to say digital rights violations keep happening. Um, so first is to track data. Then second is to provide support to those who need it once their digital rights have been violated. So we do this in partnership with um, a bunch of other organizations around Africa. You report a digital rights violation, which of course um, includes a violation of your rights, freedom of expression. And then, which takes me into our third initiative, which is um, strategic litigation. So although uh, one of the violations that could happen could be data security breaches, things like that, um, which we would, hand over to our IT experts. But in terms of something like freedom of expression, one of the best ways to, to get you redress and with those types of rights would be litigation. Um, so we've taken on a lot of litigation initiatives, one of which, of course, uh, is the Twitter ban. I think Seraph went to court before us and um, I think our case is waiting for hearing and the lawyer keeps threatening us with, you've not seen what the court did to Seraph. So um, we're, we're waiting to see how that happens. Um, it's not a duplication of efforts. A lot of things have happened in that case. And even though the court says, you know, that it was the same thing we heard that, um, but Twitter has been unbanned, so why are you still in court? Um, so it, it's, the, it's the principle of it that matters. It is that this case needs to go on for a judgment to be heard so we don't eventually see WhatsApp shut down, Instagram shut down, Facebook shut down. There needs to be some sort of pronouncement from the courts that says this type of thing is illegal. So, you know, I mean, like I said, it's one of those initiatives to protect um, the freedom of expression. We've also taken on, I, I know I said three things, this is the fourth thing and I'll stop here. <laughs> um, so the, the final thing that is important that we've taken on is training of the stakeholders that are in these spaces. Because one, Paradigm Initiative cannot do it alone, but also this information needs to be out there. So we've, we've taken on one training of civil society organizations um, and lawyers specifically to take on these litigation efforts. We have also in the past year done something new, which was training um, judges and law enforcement agents to ensure that when they see these, when they see these things come up, they would know how to address it. We we definitely saw in our training efforts some gaps. A lot of them found these things new, you know, are, are these rights that people should have. We had um, police officers wondering why you would want to report certain cases. Um, but so yeah, before I get into <laughs> The PIN experience, um, that I would say is what we have done in terms of freedom of expression.
Thank you very much, Khadija. I know that if I leave you, you have so much to say, but uh, that will be you know, more opportunity for intervention as we go to the question. I just want us to quickly, I want to read out the objective of the question before we continue, uh, so that we know why we are having the conversation. It's exactly so that we don't. So, three objectives were listed for this session. The first objective is to highlight efforts that have been made and pinpoint where increased effort is needed and advancing some of the expression online. So, and that's why it was important for that first, you know, introductory remarks. Then second is to encourage society actors to work collaboratively on these issues. And the third is to spotlight further machines like to perform such as IETA and reporting that has helped me fight it. I mean, fight for freedom of expression online. Adija, you know, already made reference to those platforms, but we'll ask other questions relating to them, especially in terms of how others use it, how can we collaborate with others, you know, in using those platforms. So I will come back to you now with uh, color, said color, right? Yeah, so uh, Seraph is known, in fact, if you don't know Seraph, you must have heard that they are in court with somebody and, and, uh, and you've kind of distinguished yourself in that regard because whenever there is an issue that why people are sitting in their head that ah, should, shouldn't somebody challenge the next thing is breaking the seraph has gone to court which which is which is very great so the question i want to ask you is that why do you do this i want people to understand and i'm going to give you an example there was a particular issue you took to court i can't remember specifically and when you tweeted it i saw a comment under your tweet saying it's not like the court will do anything about it all that even if God gives you judgment, the government will obey the judgment and all of that. So the question is, can you help us to understand why Seraph does this? Even when you, so, you know, sometimes you don't get encouraging the but why do you keep doing this? Um, thank you very much. I would have given you the short answer because we're like looking for trouble, but no, that's, that's a joke. Um, and I was, I was wondering what uh, you said Ping was doing. The way Khadija said it, is that Ayeta, the, the Yoruba for bulletproof. But the way you said it, it makes it look less fetish. It almost looked inviting. All right. Uh, um, for what, why do we do this, really? It's, I can only call it public interest. And because Serap is um, basically a legal advocacy organization, it means there must be a legal angle to everything we see, and law being... Uh, a, 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 a social a, a tool of social engineering should be able to chart a, chart a course for society. And so when we see these issues come up that we know will they affect us in the short term or in the long, long term, we put it before the courts, not only to form a precedent by way of jurisprudence, but to also create laws because judges do make laws. So when it's the law, then the previous uh, subsequent conduct is more or less um, covered. And I'll give you a very good, uh, uh, there are a lot of examples. A Twitter ban is a, is, is a good case in point. Now, there are people who may not be so much active in the digital space, possibly those in the grassroots, and they may think that the Twitter ban does not affect them, but it does. So the way the newspaper is to, possibly people in their 70s, is the way Twitter is to someone in, um, in, his, in his early teens. And you could understand that news engagement, the freedoms, rights you can think of is exercised in that digital space. So you can imagine those who were 70 who felt banning Twitter was not a problem if they take away their right to listen to radio, to watch TV and to take newspapers from them. And that, that doesn't only hurt the citizens, it also hurts the government. Because um, democracy is all about civic engagement and participation. How do they want to know what the people think? Which is why when you see people engage on those breakfast shows, you hear feedback from Nigerians. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative, but they all form part of that critical discourse that government should know how the people feel. And that doesn't only influence policy, but even legislature, the laws that they should pass and the laws they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't pass. And another e example is related to the same block I had mentioned earlier. It's the community shut down in some areas of the Northeast. You may be in the Southwest and think that it does not, but it does when you look at the human rights implications of that. In those communities that uh, telecommunication was shut down, that was uh, last year, you, you can imagine how if there are women who wanted to give birth, how would they communicate? How would they communicate their needs and challenges? And knowing fully well that healthcare facilities 
primary health care may not be functional in those areas. And it even came to light subsequently that even the military relied on those communications to, to, to communicate because maybe there were absence of long range radio. And you would see it was more of a knee jack reaction by government against insecurity. It wasn't really well thought out. And that was why within the period that the ban existed, there was, there is no, still no proof that it, it, it increased uh, security in those areas. And we, we, we went to court. Subsequently, it was lifted. So you would see the impact of that litigation on that aspect. A good example is also the SIM block. Um, do you know how many? 72 million Nigerians cannot communicate, yes. Including the block, they block, they block that line too, actually. Yeah. So you see, this is, this is more personal. Um, cannot use that. These are people who use it for the big tool of trade. So it doesn't only affect their right of freedom of expression, also their right to, to make money, to echo to live in as it were. And so we, we're saying this is just another knee-jerk reaction from government. Uh, uh, not because government does not have the right to collect our data. They do have that right. The NIMC Act is very clear on that. But there are things that need to be put in place by government that hasn't been done before. That. So you see everywhere. I pass through Ikeja every day, the NIMC office. Before 8 a.m., you see people there every day waiting to get inside to get their NIMs. And government thinks that uh, blocking their lines, for no fault of theirs, because they are just enough, not enough infrastructure to even make them register. Really, registering your NIN shouldn't take more than 10 minutes if you have the, the equipment and the infrastructure to do that. And then secondly, and this is a very good example, we've had public officers say, for instance, during the unfortunate incident in Kaduna, the train, uh, the train attack, that security agencies knew the train was going to be attacked since February. But what did they do about it? And so I'm no military expert. But wouldn't it be better if you can hear what they're saying and prevent it rather than not hear at all? And then we've seen the nuances of kidnapping that shows that even the kidnappers use the phone of the victim to make a call. So really there is no, either the legal framework or even in, in terms of technical expertise, the reason for this uh, SIM block uh, that the government, it's just another reject reaction to the accident. And then the NSAS protest, the right of people to express themselves with government thinks it's not, uh, it's not great. Again, the catch-all phrase that we've seen over time is security, national security. And I get to wonder at which, at what time, where, where, which point will we stop using national security as an excuse uh, to bridge the rest of it? I can go on and on. What about the, the directives of the NBC, that's the National Broadcasting uh, Commission, to media houses, telling them to, uh, to, to tread softly when they are reporting matters of kidnapping. So it's more or less telling a man whose house is burning, not to shout. No, you don't have to shout. Just tell us calmly that my house is burning. And then not really, that, that's what they're about. And the matter is in court as well. So you will see this, that it's called strategic litigation. It's called public interest litigation for a purpose. This is not in Seraph's interest, in the overall interest of everyone, including those who, in government who will leave government to become citizens. And then they understand the value of rights. And that is why we see them anytime they're out of office and attack to court. They remember that they have human rights. They bring applications for bail on one ground only, ill health. And then we see them in various types of contraptions, some on the neck, some on the leg, and even in places that can't be broken. I wonder how they got them broken in the first place. And so, and so that is why essentially we do what we do. Thank you very much for your very interesting response. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I, I believe that that's a round of applause, and and it's quite very interesting because if I move from Serap to Amnesty International, it's almost like a similar question for me, because uh, I have seen on TV how sometimes uh, protesters are mobilized to your office, uh, how you, in fact, how security agencies at the topmost level release statement directly attacking you. Even before I got the chance to meet you, I used to almost fear for you from a distance that why is this woman still getting the liver to do this work that she's doing? So I think this similar question for you, what drives you, what keeps you going despite all the attacks, despite all the intimidation and all of that? I've seen Amnesty International must go protests, all of those type of things. What keeps you going? I hope now that you're close to me, you are assured. Or does that make you even more fearful for your safety? At least I'm closer. I can also offer some protection. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gwe, for that. Um, it's one word, it's humanity. Um, we need to imagine a world where everybody, regardless of where you come from, can live with dignity. Um, and many of the violations that Amnesty International documents and reports, the primary attack is the dignity, the fact that the person is considered someone that does not matter, um, that the issues that have been raised are issues that should not be prioritized. And especially when it is being meted out by those who have been sent out to protect them. So it's very critical that our human, we don't lose our humanity in the name of profit, um, in the name of power, or for any other reason. That is the basic reason why we do what we do. With regards to the work that we offer, it has gone beyond just talking about violations, but also providing recommendations on how we can enhance our human rights as a means of improving development and also for ensuring that we have peace and security. As much as the security um, agencies, whether it's the military, the police, and other law enforcement agencies are concerned, security, human security, is at the bane of what we do because it's only when you have peace and stability that you can grow your wealth that you can um, enjoy uh, the fruit of your labor, so to speak, that everybody can maximize the opportunities that are available to you in this country. And right now, the insecurity that we face, the lack of um, economic opportunities that exist is as a result of violation of human rights. And while on the one hand, one of the, one of the arguments that has been given is uh, for suspending human rights is that, oh, we are trying to fight terrorism. We are trying to you know, ensure everybody is safe. But actually, repressive legislations have shown, as we have all seen, because if you live in Nigeria, uh, we've been having these legislations and these rules and regulations and restrictions on uh, who can speak, when to speak, how to speak for several years. Yet the insecurity in the country has continued to increase and it has reached a point now where the entire country, um, initially it started with, oh, 10 years ago, it's just northeast. Now it's south, south, southwest, north central, northwest. The entire country is dealing with one issue or the other, banditry, uh, armed robbery, kidnapping, abduction, um, ritual killings. Um, it's, you can go on and on on those issues. Then you have the fact that corruption, which Amnesty considers as a root, as also a factor to human rights violation, because when people are not able to access facilities, health facilities, education, um, work in a dignified manner, you find that people then start resorting to other means in order to survive. And you also find that that corruption prevents those resources from actually getting to the people that need them. So at Amnesty International, we continue to raise these issues because we recognize that our name provides some sort of buffer. We're able to access spaces which might be challenging for uh, purely national NGOs. We're also able to use the fact that we have 10 million members all over the world because our, our base as an international organization, our strength is in our membership in order to raise those issues. Because if 10 million people write a petition and get the United Nations or the African Commission, then the country is going to want to listen to see, okay, what is it that we can do to make change happen? That said, it's also critical to frame these issues using a human rights lens because that's the only way we can then justify the interventions that has been put forward. I'll give an example using forced evictions. This month marks five years when Otodugame evictions happened here in Lagos State. There's a Lagos State judgment of June 2017 that said that the forced evictions of Otodugame and Iluburin communities 
in the waterfront areas of Lagos State amounts to forced eviction and also torture because many of the people were removed from those uh, communities in the dead of night. There were armed guards to evict them forcibly. Many children since that time have not been able to return back to school. One of the arguments that the Lagos State government had given at the time was that these were illegal settlements. Well, our research showed generations. There was an elderly woman, she's still alive today, who said her grandparents were on the same land. So if her grandparents were on the same land and how she's had her own children and she has her own grandchildren, then it means that it behoves on the state to do more. Nobody is saying you can't develop communities, but you should be able to provide an alternative. And what the law, international law provides is that you must give adequate notice you must provide compensation, and you must do it in a manner that does not affect the dignity of the person. The fact that people were suffered a lot of injuries and lost their life also meant that torture and other violations to their dignity, their right to personal liberty were also impacted. You can imagine a community not having a voice, an Amnesty International being able to amplify, and also to say, but even your own courts have given a judgment to say, mm -hmm. you shouldn't have done this. Go into mediation and find the solution. For five years down the line, we are still here and we are still calling um, the, the Lagos state government to do a lot more to ensuring that those who have been forcibly evicted, families that have been displaced, those who have lost their lives, they can begin to see some sense of justice. And justice means getting them a place where they can lay their head restoring to them some of the opportunities they've lost. And what was interesting about these, their cases was that when we petitioned um, the Lagos State House of Assembly, they said, oh, they are not Nigerians. They come mm -hmm. from elsewhere. But when we showed them that they are actually polling boots and people voted in several elections, everybody kept quiet again. And then it's the fact that there were also public schools, you know, private people can see people can set up private schools anywhere, but there were also public schools that children were attending. Then how can you then provide public services in a place to people who do not, um, who, who you say do not deserve to be there? And as a result of the advocacy and the petition we did, it was online. Um, there were online petitions, there were Twitter actions, in order to draw attention to this and to say, look, you cannot use development as an excuse to evacuate the poor. Um, it helped to raise not only the issue of forced eviction in a mega city like Lagos, but it showed us the power that social media can have in terms of pushing uh, for justice. And just to end with one point, hashtag NSAS was not only online, Yes, it started and gained momentum as a result of the incidents that happened in October 2020. But the power it showed was the mobilization, the power to activate and to get people who are not traditionally civil society or NGO people, ordinary people, young people who are going about their business to share their stories and to be able to find and connect with others in order to mobilize action. I think that was powerful. The movement is still something that people are still talking about, but more importantly, it showed that if people are focused and organized, we can make change happen, not through violence, but through concerted determination, as well as amplifying the voices of those who ordinarily would not have had the opportunity or the platform in order to express their views safely, securely, and without fear or favor. And that is something that each of us should be willing to fight for, to preserve, and to ensure that that voice continues to be heard. Amnesty is running a campaign called Talk Your Truth, and the idea is how do we begin to do so in a manner that is um, in light with our rights, but also in a manner that is empowering. And it will be critical to ensure that everyone here goes, you know, leaves this room with the understanding that your right is something that somebody can take away from you because it's a human right. And that how you do so safely and securely is possible based on the experiences from Sarah Amnesty 
Paradigm Initiative and other groups who are, whose primary purpose is to ensure that we have a voice and that we use it effectively for social justice. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, we can clap if you want to clap. Yeah, thank you for, for your kind response. And you know, uh, just as you were speaking, I was thinking about uh, the, the importance of uh, digital platform to our ability as civics or as, as, even as individuals to really, you know, express ourselves. But beyond expression, I think a few years ago, we used to talk about uh, digital platforms as the new market square, kind of, or town hall, right? But a few days ago, I was reading uh, a write-up by the Reddit, the founder of Reddit. And he was saying that people don't realize that we have moved away from that to the fact that it is no longer the, the town hall or the digital market square. It is now where we exist. So it's not just that we go there to talk or to express ourselves. This is literally our life. So, you know, the, the need to protect the space is no longer because we want to protect where we go to express ourselves. It's more like just protecting yourself. Khadija, so I want to switch up the conversation a little bit, uh, and I would love to also come to the audience to hear uh, your thoughts. Uh, but Khadija, I want to kind of build the cards. So, just as we were having this conversation, I think when Osai was making an intervention, my phone was ringing, and guess who was calling? It was Channel TV. And I'd responded that they should send a text message so that, uh, because I couldn't pick. And, and they sent the text message. And basically, the, the, what they are asking is, they want us to have a conversation later in the day about Twitter, right? When Twitter was suspended in Nigeria and people started making noise, we went to court and all of that. I remember one person who was speaking for the government saying that, ah, it's not just a social media platform. There are many of them. So why are people kind? It's not just a private company and all of that. So I know you use Twitter a lot. So the question is, why Twitter? That why why do we take Twitter so seriously? <laughs> this this feels like a personal attack. <laughs> um, this is because boy will come to the office and ask me if I sleep. Why were you on Twitter by one a.m.? Okay, so I I think. There's no better response than what than what Kola Wale said earlier. And it's something, it's a line that I'm going to use forever now. So thank you. Where he said, um, you know, social media platforms to people in their teens, and I think it's actually people beyond that, almost people approaching their 30s now as well, is to, you know, the the older, the boomers, the 60, 70 year olds, um, it is their source of news it is their source of connection that is like boy said where we live um i can put it to the room when last did you read a newspaper who like and and i'm almost certain that those who have read newspapers recently in the past two weeks ish are way older than i am I, my, my channel's TV is on my phone. <laughs> my Arise News is on my phone. When the, even when the CNN documentary came out about the NSAS protest, I watched it on Twitter. Um, and Twitter is different from Facebook and Instagram in the way that this, this almost sounds like a campaign for Elon Musk's <laughs> platform. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, Different in the sense that it is more for conversation. It's more for, you know, Instagram, you, you go there to, it's more pictorial videos and stuff like that. But Twitter is particularly positioned for more socioeconomic discourse. I know it's less, it can be less serious than that, but it's um, positioned for that. It is positioned in a way that you can have communications with your government. You know, if you are on Twitter as much as I am, then you know that before the ban, 
while the president is making all his speeches, Independence Day speech and all of that, somebody is tweeting the speech line by line. And you as an individual, in a way that you would have never had access before, can respond to the president's tweets and tell him this, 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 this. Even though it's not the president that is holding, <laughs> it's not the president that is seeing it, but different individuals, we have been able to communicate with different individuals in power because of social media platforms in a way that our parents never had access to. At least we know that there are certain legislators who use their, their, their own handles themselves. Um, people like Saraki uses his handle himself. Uh, and we've been able to communicate, you know, even the, the, the respite that comes from dragging certain individuals online, you know that they have seen it, they have heard it, you know. And before I started um, working at Paradigm Initiative, I interned at the National Assembly. Um, so I was privy to certain conversations with legislators, and you could tell that they saw these things, they, they see what we are saying, they see what our concerns are, and it is in a way that can never be done on a morning show because the person there has been told, you cannot talk about this, you cannot talk about this, you can't say this, you can't do this. It, it can't be done on a morning show. It can't be done um, on a newspaper because even they have their own politics. It is in a way that can be conveyed only by individuals. It has Social media has, in fact, um, revolutionized the civic space and it is why we need to protect it who knows um, companies come and go twitter might not be there tomorrow it might be something else it might be adamo garba's cool <laughs> um but whatever comes next <laughs> whatever comes next we need to protect um social media spaces while also holding them accountable because they, they they can be complicit um in their own ways too but it's it has given us opportunities that that was never there before not just twitter facebook instagram whatever else is out there so yeah all right thank you very much for your response uh, Khadija. and this is where i come to to you uh, the audience and i'll take two comments at this point if you are interested in contributing to the conversation one man one woman i already have my man the man in white shirt i'm looking for a woman right now okay are you raising your hand black jacket okay i'm looking for a woman look you allow me day okay i have a we have a man and a woman uh mr Med, i'm sorry for this lot uh the two people i have them already but be sure that I'll come back to, to the audience again. And I don't think we, sh we can effectively have this conversation without talking about the latest development, which is the fact that now Twitter has a new owner. Uh, in terms of our ability to freely express ourselves, like Adija said, I think for many of us, we have leveraged that platform, another digital platform for the purpose of free expression. Uh, there, are, there used to be, I mean, there are a lot of many, uh, there are a lot of bottlenecks to being able to express yourself, if you are, if you are to rely on, you know, the traditional means, you know, of expression, like using newspaper or TV, if you have to go to TV to go and express yourself, by the time they give you a bill, you would prefer to be deaf and dumb forever. So, but this platform gives us an opportunity to, you know, express ourselves freely, openly, without being held back. And Kadija gave, you know, examples of Sometimes when even some people that have access to, to those platforms, and I'm, and I'm sure Kola and Osai can bear witness to this, there are times get, you get into a TV station or a radio station, and they are telling you, you can't talk about this. You can't talk about this because they are trying to avoid NBC, NBC hammer. So, but this platform gives us this opportunity for expression. But there are other concerns that have also come up with the fact that these are private platforms. So you, as a as an individual. So the question I want you to answer is, or the intervention I want you to make is, uh, how, do you, how do you see uh, some of these digital platforms, bearing in mind that they are private platforms, and especially Twitter now, let's narrow it down to Twitter. Twitter now has a new owner, which means that uh, its policy, the direction, and all of that will be shaped differently in the coming days. 
So what are your thoughts around this? So I'll come uh, to you first. Please, when you are speaking, make sure you introduce yourself first before you speak so that people in the room can get a sense of who is speaking. Do you have a microphone already? Please, can we have one microphone for this intervention? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joseph Olaoluwa. I'm a journalist. I write for the International Center for Investigative Reporting, ICIR. It's in Abuja and also in Lagos. Uh, about the intervention, about uh, Twitter, I, I don't want to speculate. And although that's not what I want to, I want to ask a few questions. But the intervention uh, for Twitter, I think um, to be very factual with you, I'm a business, I'm a business journalist. Anybody can buy Twitter. If you have more money than the person that bought it, you can buy it too. So, actually, it's a private enterprise for profit. <laughs> you get there are other concerns around um, privacy and the rest too, but it's still a it's a shareholder decision. You understand? And whoever buys it has the right to do you know what he thinks he can do. So I don't I don't we speculate about okay what Mox will do, what Mox will not do, but he hasn't done anything yet. So you should keep a free and open mind and you know, see how. When it comes up, you know, engage like that. So that's for that's for Twitter. Uh, to the questions I want to ask, uh, I want to uh, talk to Sarah. Uh, I want to ask them about. Uh, I like the fact that uh, you said that there are seven lawsuits, you know, ongoing at all levels. Uh, I want to ask, like, how do you get funding for these lawsuits? You know, I know that lawsuits cost money and takes a lot of time. Uh, Are you sure you're not doing investigative reporting with your question? <laughs> so, I want to ask, I want to, I would like to know, and I don't know if, sometimes I don't know if you think it's frivolous. I don't think you know, I don't, I don't know if you think it's frivolous, but um, we hear the lawsuits every time. I'm like, where are we getting the money and why so many lawsuits? Uh, are there other ways of interven intervening or interventions with them? Uh, that's for... Um, Sarah, for Amnesty International, I want to ask a question, uh, something that's quite burning. Uh, recently, recently uh, there was a report uh, by two organizations, one for mine and one before mine, uh, questioning uh, Amnesty International's influence. Now, there's a story by David Undeni, which is um, Amnesty International compromised by the secret police. A and DSS. Uh, after that story, my organization did a story similar to that. And then after that, uh, Shawere was asking for Amnesty International to be closed down, that they were not you know, do, pertaining to doing the rights of um, the ordinary persons. Now, I understand that Amnesty International is a big organization and that there could be influences from DSS, from AI from other interests, other burgeoning interests. I want to know why Amnesty International has not responded to these claims about how independent their, their, their activities are, you know, how transparent, because as much as we come here and talk about digital rights and digital, all of these things, we also need to be sure that we are on the good side too as well, because I'm a press person, I have to be on a neutral side as well. So if I'm fighting for your rights, I have to be also on a neutral side as well and try and avoid as much as bad press as possible. Or if they're a bad press, try and clear the air. About it. So I'm, I'm worried about the fact that, okay, Amnesty is embroiled in some conversations that is questioning how fruitful they are. And I would like Amnesty International to speak to that. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think, okay, we have one more coming. They will come back later. Ola Miri at the back. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Olamide. Um, I don't know. What do I do? <laughs> I'm an independent <laughs> marketing consultant. So first, I'll talk about um, the matter at hand, the, the, the sale of um, Twitter to Elon Musk. Um, I'd like to quite disagree with the first person who spoke about Twitter being a private business. I mean, Peter, uh, <laughs> 
Twitter is actually a public company as of now because, I mean, they have IPO and all that, but Elon is going to take it private. And I think that the reason why a lot of people are concerned is because um, over the last few years, we saw the impact of um, Twitter in elections across the world, you know. Um, how, don't let me call any um, country, but we know there are bot farms across the world, in Asia, in Europe, and all that, and how politicians use it to influence elections. So, I mean, people are a bit worried, and we know the impact that um, Donald Trump had on Twitter, you know, a tweet from him could, you know, um, you know, spike um, a, what's it called, a stock, you know, of a particular company. But, I mean, we sh I don't think, you know, I've been seeing a lot of opinions, but I'm very indifferent about it because, I mean, Twitter as a company has policies. And for Twitter to run in, in, in um, countries, I mean, I don't know about Africa, but in Europe, they are really stringent laws that and policies that they have so yeah Elon Musk can tweet and you know be happy and be excited but by the time uh, continents like the European Union or unions like the European Union give them sanction them with fines and all that I'm sure that um, it, they can't they can't undo but um, let's let's talk about the the freedom, I don't think, I think Twitter is about the freest social media platform that we have now. There's nothing you want to say on Twitter that you cannot say right now. So um, I'm very optimistic that we'll, we'll still have that um, access to f um, freedom of information. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, the first speaker has asked some of my questions, but I want to direct this to um, Serap. I'm very surprised. And when you told, when you said um, you just have 37, I'm like, really? Every headline is breaking, Sarah, as you know. So I want to ask, you know, to compliment his question. Do you do this for fun? Because sometimes um, some of this, we just hear the beginning of the lawsuits. There's no follow-up. And then because if you really have, I'm with you. But I really need to ask, you know, on behalf of other parents, if this lawsuits really mean a lot to you, I don't think you should be dishing out lawsuits, you know, the way you do. Yes, it is you holding the government accountable. But it doesn't also look good, you know, that everyone feels like, oh, Sarah, they will sue the government. You know, I don't think that there's death in it, you know, but maybe when you tell us why you do it, and if you don't just do it to make headlines or because you have funding, I mean, we'll have a better understanding. Then I'm really interested um, for Amnesty International. I was really going to ask about the um, the report that we saw online. Um, are you really biased as an organization? I respect the work that you do, but I mean, as much as you hold government institutions accountable, you should also know that um, you can be held accountable. So look forward to your responses. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, if you won't clap for us, you ask for it. So you know, the, on the light, on the lighter side, the very interesting thing was that David was meant to be on this panel. That's David Undeen from Newswire. And at the time, the invitations were sent out. Uh, the report was not out yet. Uh, so okay, I had seen the report, but my colleagues who were handling the invitations had not seen it. So when I saw, so when I saw the invitations. And I'm like, okay, you want to bring these people, two people to the same panel? Have you seen the report? So I had to send it to Khadija that, go and read this report. So, I, I mean, when you had the question, I had mixed feeling uh, between, would this be the appropriate platform for that to be addressed or not? But thankfully, uh, Osai would respond to it. And also the other question about Sarah, uh, in my mind, I'm like, okay, people really came to get for the two of you. <laughs> yeah, so. Before they go on, okay, all right. So, okay, Kadija will make a comment, then uh, Kola will respond to the question you asked about uh, Sarah. So I think you can take the two questions together about Sarah, and then Osai will also respond to the question about uh, Amnesty International. But as much as possible, I don't want to derail the direction of this uh, this meeting because that's the reason why we are having this conversation. So, 
Osa will give a response, but if there are follow-up, you can always follow up, maybe via emails and all of that. But I don't want this question to be turned into addressing that particular issue. So Khadija, please. Um, thank you. So I just want to say that um, as a human rights advocate who does the work that I do, I get that. Um, so this is me responding to Olamide and actually you as well. All of us see Serap's breaking news and we joke about it, breaking, breaking. But I believe that as Nigerians, we need to interact with the law more. I do not find the work that they do frivolous. And this is because if more people were doing it, it would look less like Serap was doing so much um, frivolous work. If you look at countries like America, where I was talking to my colleague outside just now about um, a lady who sued Starbucks because coffee poured on her um, and it was too hot and she won. The reason why Nigeria is the way it is is because we do not have strengthened institutions. A lot of us say that we have the laws, but it's the implementation that is the problem. Where and how else do you implement, if not the court of law? If you went to law school, you've heard the court is the last hope of the common man. If we don't do it, how do we get justice? And it's funny because we've, part of the initiative has been to court and we've been called a busybody by the court before. But we don't even realize as we sit down here how many rights we enjoy because somebody did the work of busybody. Um, for every, say, feminist that is in this room, a lot of the rights that you enjoy now is because of the rights that people were killed for back in the day. And a lot of the rights I believe we would eventually enjoy, a lot of the things that would eventually be enforced is because of the work that people like Serap do. So just to end this in, I don't know what the year was, but um, the year when that USSD code came up with the NIN thing where you can put your date of birth and your last name and your NIN would pop out. Um, it's easy to get anybody's last name and date of birth. Uh, Osai, who is quite famous, I can go on Wikipedia, find her last name, her date of birth, put it on um, NIMC's website, and then I'll find her NIN. Her NIN will give me access to her BVN and other um, information. When that happened, a lot of people were happy. You know, this is an easy way to do it. But people like Paradigm Initiative saw that hmm, the type of data breaches that, that could come from this was immense. So we ran to court, and then NIMSI immediately removed, um, they, they changed the whole process. And we didn't eventually get a full judgment on that because we had already settled it. But if things like that do not happen, then change would not come. And the reason why you don't see as much follow-up is because a case can take 10 years, five years. The, we, we took the case on the Twitter ban to court. I cannot remember when. We've not been heard. It's mention adjournment, mention adjournment, two months adjournment. So by the time a judgment does come, um, it, it could have taken some time, but the change is necessary. So, um, open up, hoping I've not taken too much from Paula's response. Oh, th thank you very much. I will let Paula respond. To be honest, I was also tempted, want to jump on it, but I remember that my role there is a moderator, so I will stay <laughs> within my calling. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Katija. So remind me when I'm president, I'll make you my lie, Mohammed. <laughs> um, so to speak to, and first to, to say that Elon Musk uh, bought Twitter, it's good. In Nigeria, people are spending 100 million naira to buy home. Thank God they are not the one buying Twitter. Um, funding for our suits. Uh, in, uh, Luminate is one of our funders, by the way, and I'm sure they are one of the ones funding this event. So our funders are, they have always been known. So the Makato Foundation is one of our funders. And it, incidentally, they are also funding various agencies of government, including the Nigerian Bar Association, the NED, Osiwa, Port Foundation. These are donors that fund development work. 
knowing fully well that public interest or strategic litigation is an activity that uh, teases out, like Khadija had said, various issues that needs to be litigated on. Um, Roe versus Wade in the US is a, is a classic because somebody went to court to challenge the right to life, the right of women to uh, the, the, the abort or uh, time period. It will not, there are lots of litigation in Nigeria public that, that defines what we can do. For instance, the power of the Attorney General of the Federation under Section 174 of the Constitution to enter what is called a nolle prosecute. And what it simply means is this. The Attorney General has the power to take over any criminal case in Nigeria at any time and discontinue it. You may not know what that means until the offender has done something wrong to you. And that it means if judgment is tomorrow for a case that has gone on for 10 years, the Attorney General can come in today, take up that case, and discontinue. And no one can challenge it. And there are many lawyers who are there to go to court to challenge what public interest means, even though the constitution says he must exercise that power in the public interest. So imagine if someone had done something wrong to you. I don't want to give you instances. You can think of any crime that is grievous. And the person had been charged to court. And you, you were hopeful that you get justice. And then the attorney general comes and does that. And he tells you that's what the law says. And then your lawyer tells you that the law says you should act in the public interest. Won't you ask your lawyer what public interest means? And lawyers have gone to court on that case to try to tell the court to explain what is public interest. That is how powerful strategic litigation is. And there are lots of examples. Twitter banned a case in point. We were able to get an injunction from the ECOWAS support that stopped the federal government. If you recall at that time, the Attorney General of the Federation had come out to say that anybody that was found using VPNs or any other motion would be arrested. And this is when we are challenging the ban itself for being unlawful, and then you are threatening that we will ever, whichever way we access Twitter, you are going to uh, uh, charge us for a criminal offense, which is not a crime, by the way. And we had gone to court, and the court granted an interim injunction, stopping the Attorney General for, from doing that, which I believe is why they couldn't arrest anyone, even though it was obvious that people were tweeting using VPN. And that is the power of strategic political. I can go on and on. We've had judgments against governments, most of which are yet to be enforced. But like I've said, that's why it's called strategic litigation, to challenge vital areas of law. For instance, the right you enjoy to bail. People have gone to court to explain what 48 hours the constitutional provisions mean. Does it mean that if there's a court within the 20 kilometer radius, for instance, and you would understand those things when you are either a victim or you are a stakeholder in those things as they unfold. And to speak to uh, the, the quantity of the suits, though, to speak, if you ask me, I really think there are still too few, given the issues as they come up. And that clearly brings me to what Karija said about interacting with laws. Section 6 of the Constitution says clearly, that the judiciary, and that means every court in Nigeria, is the organization, the arm of government that will determine rights between individuals, between arms and tiers of government, and between government and the citizens. And that is what we are doing. Unless you prefer that we carry guns, which of course will be unlawful, which is what some people are doing because they've seen that the system, they think the system will not give them justice. And so we are going to court submitting to an intermediary, which is clearly lawful to determine whether we are right, whether government is right, and what the law is. And these laws, these courts have been trying their best to determine um, what the law is. So we are doing that because the issues keep coming up and we have to rise up to the occasion to get the courts, as it is said, the last hope of the common man uh, to be able to determine what is right in this instance and what is wrong. Thank you. I mean, thank you for your response. And this, before you come in, I just want to add something that uh, someone said in one of the sessions we had yesterday uh, in the evening, that if you take a boss case to the courts, that uh, the judge probably has about 15,000 precedents he can look into to help him make a determination. Okay, you were the one who made that the, uh, intervention yesterday. But if you take a digital rights case to the courts, it is going to be difficult for the judge to even find a precedent to rely on. And that's why this issue becomes complicated. So one of the decisions we made yesterday is that we are going to keep going to courts. So what you have seen is child's play. As a matter of that paradigm, as a matter of fact, paradigm initiative is currently sourcing for lawyers to work with. 
because we want to do as many you know litigation as possible because the space is too is too empty like in terms from from litigation point of view it is too empty the judges don't understand the issues there are no precedents to rely on so we need to litigate as many cases as possible so that in 10 15 years the generation that will come they will not have as much challenge in terms of getting justice on digital rights related issues so uh, like they say where I come from, we're just bringing the bird from the from our pocket. There's still a lot to do. So I'll let you come in now. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just to add also quickly around the strategic litigation, because I think um, a lot of us miss the point. Sometimes the fact that you could even apply is a win in itself. The fact that somebody is documenting and recognizing that something is not working is actually quite useful. And yes, Sarah might be alone mostly on this front, but there are many more cases that have been brought up by others. It's just that Sarah is also very active in also sharing it. Because I'm sure if I mention some successful cases, you'll be like, oh, who did that? When did that happen? How that how that achieved? And one example, for example, is the Abuja rates. Um, there was a raid of um, women in 20, I think it was 20, was it 2018? Can, can I remember? 2019. Was it 2019? Yes, 2019. In April, incidentally, it was in April too. But last year, a high court in uh, Abuja granted judgment and said that those raids were unlawful. Are you aware of that? Right? So it's also about how we also share and publicize. It's just that Serap does a better job of publicizing what they do. A lot more litigation is going on and a lot more people are getting successful. Before we heard of the case of the um, is it police woman who was found pregnant, there was already a decision that Mrs. Falana had taken to court challenging the um, regulations in the police uh, regulations saying that um, unmarried females cannot uh, get pregnant or they need the permission of their superiors to actually get married. Are you aware of that provision? And it has been challenged in the court here in Lagos State. So a lot is happening. Um, and so we need to also recognize that unless some, what do they say? They say don't, don't, uh, uh, don't agonize, organize, right? That's what the labor movement say. If you want change to happen, and if you want human rights to be your reality, then you have to organize to make sure that your voices are heard. And strategic litigation is a nonviolent way of getting your voices heard. And the good thing about it is that even if, especially when you engage with the regional courts, even if you get a decision and it's not implemented immediately, it is still there, it still stands. And we know for the ECOWAS court, for example, there were so many cases against the Gambia on freedom of expression. And what happened is that when there was a change of government, eventually all those decisions became enforceable in that current, in the current um, administration. So can you imagine if the family members of those journalists that had been possibly disappeared or had lost their lives, I said, oh, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. Let's not go to court they would not be getting the compensation and the acknowledgement that the state had a hand in the um, enforced disappearance and death of their missing loved ones. So let's not look at it like, oh, it seems to be happening a lot of time, but what can we do to amplify and um, extend that? So more directly in terms of um, what Amnesty International does um, and the, this, this article that had come out, the thing is, Amnesty International is an independent and impartial organization. We are non-political. We do not support any particular religion. And we do our work without fear or favor. So what that means is that a lot of the decisions we take is based on human rights principles and standards. We recognize that in the work that we do, some people might disagree with our approach but well, we always explain the methodology of the research we do and also how we carry out these activities. Um, and so on that point, I think that's what I would, I would rest on. Also the fact that we've done a lot of work in Nigeria. If there's one organization that has been specifically targeted 
by the federal government and the Nigerian military, it's Amnesty International. And during the NSAS protests, there were even attempts at derailing us, calling us all kinds of names, terrorists, funding, um, supporting Boko Haram. And we stood still because we knew that the work that we do is very important and we prioritize it. And this has come at very great personal cost. Myself and my colleagues who do the tireless work. We are less than 20 in the office covering the entire country. So you can imagine the amount of work and the pressures in terms of saying that you can actually deploy and cover as many human rights um, uh, situations as it occurs. And we do this with the conviction that it's about humanity. If one person's life can be changed, we'll do the little that we can. But within the confines and the rules and regulations of an international organization like Amnesty International, which is present in several countries, sometimes that might not seem so very clear to people, but we do it with sincerity of purpose and also with the, with the recognition that the work we do is to ensure that everyone gets a fair chance. The only thing we ask as well is that you also give us a fair chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I've just been told that I have less than 10 minutes and I want to get more input from the audience. Uh, I see two men raising their hand. So no man should raise up his hand again. So if there are women who want to speak, you can raise up your hand. I've noted you, Mr. Ahmed, and sir. Yeah, if there are women who want to speak, please can you raise up your hand? And you would have just 90 minutes to speak. Uh, sorry, 90 seconds, 90 seconds. Sunny, please, you do me a favor. You do me a favor, you hold the mic. Uh, Sunny, you hold the mic, and then once it's 90 seconds, I'll signal you, take it off. So please, this is where to deploy your summary skills. So let's start from uh, Mr. Ahmed on the left. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let me start with Amnesty International. Let me start by um, appreciating your effort. My name is Idris Mohamed. I'm a journalist appreciating your efforts trying to find my closest friend in University of Bakar Data. So my question, um, this one is, um, apart from protests, please, what are the other tools deployed in defending people's rights? And the second one is, um, we had a conversation last month in Abuja in the same, this issue of showcase civic space, especially in the media space. Um, Please, what can you do in collaboration with AUG and also the legal practitioners? Maybe if they can offer pro bono to protect the journalists because the reason why issues of insecurities are not in the Nigerian media space, especially from the Northern part, because of the challenges journalists are facing in the North. There are some certain stories you can report because edit, I, I shared experiences that how they says just detain me because I report story about Kakara boys abduction. And let me go to the Sarah. And the, the reason why they shut down internet in Katsuna, I'm from Katsuna, Kaduna, and some other Northwest region, was just because people are reporting attacks on social media, not because they want to crack down and um, bandit. Because any time bandit attack community, before you know, in less than one second, one minute people report so, so there were a lot of reports of attacks. So they want to shut down those voices. That was the reason why they shut down internet. Apart from that one, they don't have any reason again. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, Sunny, uh the rule is you hold the mic, right? Want so we do it now. We need no, to correct it, it, the wrong. It's fine. It's yeah. fine. My name is Jonathan. I'm a lawyer. And um, uh, I want to first thank Kola and Sarah for the work that they do. Matter of fact, DRLI just filed a case against MTN. I am the applicant in that case. It's about access to the internet. And I made extensive use of the decision of um, ECOWAS 
Court of Justice in Twitter Bank's case. And why it's important is because locally, most of the decisions we've had when it comes to digital rights, so private privacy, data protection, have had to do with the right to privacy under the Constitution. No law, no court in Nigeria has identified or accepted the right to freedom of expression online as a constitutional right. Only in the Twitter case was it decided. Aside that, you have foreign cons I mean, decisions, India and many other countries, where it has been stated that the right to freedom of expression online is a constitutional right. So you're doing a great job, and I thank you for that. The only question I want to ask is, you get judgments from regional courts. Even though the protocols have not been domesticated, there are other procedures that we can use to enforce these judgments. Why is Serap not enforcing judgments obtained through regional courts? Because I think that it is not enough to make a statement by saying this right exists. We should at least make the attempt. It puts these state actors more on the spot. So I want to know why Serap isn't taking that step. At least regional, I mean, judgments obtained from regional courts. For Amnesty, I'm a member, at least online, I volunteer, I, I mean, participate in campaigns as much as I can. I read so much about you, Sai, and I can only appreciate you for what you do. Um, like my friend Idris said, you do a lot of campaigns, especially online. We sign petitions across the world, not just for Nigerians, but for other persons. But I would want to see a situation where AI is more involved in using the legal system. Forget the bottlenecks. Yes, I admit, whether for public interest litigation or otherwise, there's a lot to deal with. But I think also that once in a while, we get a bold judge who decides to make a break from the crowd. So I want a situation where AI is also involved in this process. That's just, it's a comment, it's not a question. All right, thank you very much. Uh, those are the two hands that I saw. But if there is any woman in the audience who wants to speak, I can still allow at least one woman to speak. Otherwise, let me come back to, to the panelists. Is there anybody? Okay, so let me just come to our, panel, uh, to our panelists. Thankfully, I have a very fair balance. I have two women on the panel and just one man. So, uh, we've run out of time, which means that we don't really have a lot of time to, you know, to speak again. But, well, I would love you to maximize your final comments to perhaps respond to any of the issues that were raised and also to leave us with uh, a passing sentence, phrase, or something you just want us to go on with. So, I will start from you, Katija. Can I start from you? All right. Um. Hmm. Phrase. And Khadija, please, if you can also use this opportunity to talk about the platforms you spoke to earlier, the IETA report here, can people use it? What other ways can others benefit from it? Um, so I would start by hammering on something I said earlier, which was that if more people were doing the things that Serap was doing, they wouldn't look like this unicorn. <laughs> we all we all need to interact with the law better. We all need to challenge the government more. Um, during the NSAS protest, we were told that um, the new generation are more courageous than the old. They know how to um, stand up to oppose government. And I understand that a lot of us were shaken by um, lives being lost. And suddenly we understood the apprehension that our parents had about things like protesting. But like Paula said, the type of advocacy that we are doing is a non-violent way. It's, it's one of the safest ways of attaining justice. So bringing me to... Um, Paradigm Initiative's flagship platforms. First is IETA. Um, like I said, it's a digital rights toolkit. The first part of it explains to you who the digital rights actors are, what your role in the space can be. The second part is now 
um, the things that you can, the, the second part is, is digital security center. And um, the last part now talks about um, censorship, internet shutdowns and stuff like that. Uh, you can get it on Africa. The second uh, flagship platform, which I, I believe is most important for this conversation is Reporty. So in a situation where you want to do, as I have said, and you want to interact with the law more, you've seen a digital rights violation, and you believe that we should take this thing to court, then people like Paradigm Initiative are ready to support you. And I'm hoping that we have um, lawyers in the room here who are willing to offer us you know, your services for a very, very tiny fee. <laughs> um, but once you, you report a violation, we would follow up with you and see the interventions that we can um, come up with on that particular issue. A lot of it, of course, will be centered around litigation. So let's work together to make Nigeria better. Nice to meet you, Osai. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I checked. I think it's important for us to know that there are, there are various means through which we can uh, through which we can express ourselves. And like he said, protest is one. Um, others is advocacy. We do a lot of advocacy at national, regional, and international level uh, because oftentimes. Our governments, when they go to the UN General Assembly, they are going to meet their peers. So if other countries are asking them questions about the human rights situation in their country, it forces them to rethink because it means if you come back again in another three or four years and you're still saying the same thing, then it means that you're not making much progress. So advocacy is also one tool through which we're also able to push um, our activities. Human rights education is also something that we are not using so much in Nigeria. But when people are more equipped and aware of what their rights are, you find out that they are also less vulnerable. And they're also better able to push back. Because like I said, we all can't be in every um, place in, in um, Nigeria. But one person making a difference can mobilize other people in their community. Um, training, um, Amnesty runs uh, lots of academies, I think Paradigm Initiative as well. Most of our courses are online. We recognize that many people might not have access to that, but we also work with other partners. We've done training with, I think, Premium Times, they are now Center for something else. Yes, CIJD, um, for lawyers, also for the media. I wanted to share that um, just this weekend, um, our European colleagues were able to push using advocacy to get the Digital Services Act uh, passed at the EU. The EU has agreed on a deal. And what that means is that big tech companies can also be held to account in terms of how they use their platform or their platform is then used for abuses. And it's critical to say this because oftentimes when we talk of accountability, we think of states, but we also do accountability looking at corporations. Amnesty's work in Nigeria with regards to multinationals in the oil industry, Shell in particular, is really right. So we're looking at it not only in terms of the fact that the Ogoni Nine were executed under a military dictatorship as a result of agitating um, against oil companies, but also the environmental damages and the continued advocacy to clean up the Niger Delta. Instrumentally also, Amnesty has released a report on how you know social media can also be a harmful place, particularly for women. I will encourage everyone to go online to look at um, two um, reports we've done on Twitter about Twitter being a toxic, toxic place for women, um, and this covered research across the world, whereby we found that because the the way the policies have been designed, it's often gender blind, with people not realizing that the policies and the way the policies are applied are discriminatory against women. This has led to a lot of women leaving Twitter or diminishing their voice on Twitter. It can also explain why many women don't feel so confident speaking in spaces, even when given the opportunity to do so, because they know that there is a price for being a vocal, confident woman online or offline. 
So that's also a study that Amnesty did, which you can check. And the last one was a study specifically on the United States, in which Amnesty also made specific recommendations to Twitter as to what needs to change. And Twitter, of course, said, oh, we're going to do something about it, recognizing that oftentimes when women make complaints about the way they've been treated online, these current social guidelines and policies are not really enhancing um, that. And the last word I'd like to leave is for my sisters in the room. You have a voice, you own it, you own your space. People are going to say whatever they want to say, but it's important that the more you speak up, the more your voices are heard and you can begin to contribute to the discussions at hand, whether it's online or offline, and that there are resources available to keep you safe and also to ensure that you can um, have um, the opportunities to enhance connections and opportunities. Thank you very much. Hola. Okay. Thank you very much, Bray. It's been a very interesting conversation. I'd like to just respond that uh, we are taking steps along the lines of enforcing some of the regional judgments we've got from the regional courts. It's something we are working on. And even the ones we've had in local courts. And I, will, I forgot to mention two of them earlier. We had gotten a judgment at the Lagos State High Court, for instance, and we've gotten good feedback. Um, stopping government hospitals from insisting on people donating blood before they attend to women that want to, uh, that want to give birth in those hospitals. We saw it as a human rights issue, and we, had got to, we went to court, and we won. And we've had feedbacks from citizens just like you. They are not even lawyers who requested for a copy of that judgment because they want to use it to insist on their rights in those hospitals. You can, you can imagine what will go through someone's mind if he, before they attend to his wife is about to give birth, he must be able to donate blood. Really, you would understand that that's, uh, that's a breach of his human rights. And secondly, the judgment we've got, we got from the federal court, stopping public officers who are earning from the state to also earn uh, from, it, we call it double, double emolument. And this is just a simple scenario. Somebody used to be the, a, a governor, and he earns pension, by the way, huge pensions every year, and then he's now appointed a minister. So he's earning two jumbo pay from the state, whereas ordinary people are earning, it's not even a rodent. You can't call it a rodent pay. It's like a cockroach pay. And the court agreed with us. And so that's another judgment that it's in the public domain that we're trying to enforce. And so we'll continue to do this. And in, this, if we put out this tweet, or these public advocacy initiatives calling on Nigerians to join a public interest litigation, it would be helpful if we understand that this is a collective work uh, that we all need uh, to, to join it. And that reminds me, as I ran off, of this uh, Yoruba proverb. I will try to do a bit of transliteration. It says, It it simply means that, uh, I don't know whether it translates into English, it means that uh, death that took your closest ally is warning you. So when it comes, I hope you are prepared. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to our panelists. Can you please help me to appreciate our panelists one more time? Khadija Helisman, Paradigm Initiative, Osai Ojigo, Amnesty International, and Kola Wale. Uh, I guess this will be the end of the session.